All right, this is part two, and in this part we're going to be talking about those three optometers, the proptors on the left, the Chagon, the Wolf ski optometer, the Chagon ski optometer, and the Genothomic refractor, and uh, the British refracting unit, which came later. It all started in 1909, when Nathan Chagon uh, applied for a, an optometer. You see it's all monocular. But what made it different from all the others is he had a mechanism where you, there's only eight there's only eight lenses in this whole thing, twenty five, fifty, seventy five, and one, and when you get to one, it's a gear that clicks it up to the next four, which is one twenty five, two fifty, three seventy five, and five. They're all plus. It gives a range of from Plano to plus six, and that was monocular, and it got the patent in nineteen ten, as you can see there. You can pause it if you want to see anything in more detail. I'm not going to be holding this for very long each time. In 1915, he got the idea to make a, bin a binocular one. As you can see, instead of being one symmetrical optometer for, for each eye, so you, you did one eye, and like all optometers of the time, this is what optometers looked like way back in the 1800s and 1700s. Just typical. You hold it up there. To do one eye at a time, there was no way of measuring phorias. But in the 1915 patent, which he was awarded in 1918, which doesn't matter because he started making them in 1915, there's left one, right one, all of the, everything, and on the back there's auxiliary lenses. Let me, let me show you what it looks like. Now it's binocular though. You see, got two eyes. There's a near point chart. This is possibly the first phoropter. A patent in 1915. He's from New York City. He was from the Bronx. He had it made by uh, William Rymola in Philadelphia. Let me show you how it works. Let me line this up just right here. You can see it's got a Stevens ferrometer on it. That's for measuring Fourier's. These things all had Stevens ferrometers on them. Um, what do we have here? You got two things to measure. You got a 125 in Plano, 125 and a quarter, 125 and 50. I don't know if you can see that. 125 and 75, 125 and 1. And then it clicks up to 250. See that? Stevens ferrometer. And that's all it had on it. That was 1915. And somebody named Michael Wolf, who also lived in New York City, he lived in Manhattan. He liked it so much he decided to uh, buy him out, but he had his own patent. Now, this is a Wolf ski optometer. If you look at this, you see that this mechanism in the front here, let me line it up just right here. This is exactly the same as the Chagon. This is the same. Okay, only on you do it on the top here. It's got, and you can read it off. I don't know if I can see it. I don't have a cameraman here. See that? 375 and 50, 375 and 75. And then it goes up to 5. The difference is this has cylinder. Here's your Stevens ferrometer. Here's a Risley prism. Another Risley prism. There was no Maddox rods on this one. And there's spaces in here to put trial lenses if the cylinder this the cylinder only goes there's only one there's only one ring of cylinders. There's no mechanism to, to advance it. So it only goes cylinder. And you read it off down here. Let me get this in the light better. The way they I don't know if you can read it, but there's just one disc of cylinders. It goes up to minus two. Anyway, here's how you do the axis. There's a needle, and you can see it's marked the axis of the cylinder. You press the needle up, move, adjust the axis of the cylinder, and then adjust the axis of all the lenses inside of that battery. There's a battery of cylinder lenses here. And that adjusts the axis of all of them at the same time. So when you click one, it's automatically in the right axis. 
I actually had this thing cleaned and refurbished. There's a guy in Texas that actually did that. I couldn't believe it. I'm going to clean a 100-year-old for out there. Well, the way it works, these all, these all hang upside down because they're supported from the bottom. That's actually a forehead rest right there. It's a forehead rest. The patient goes like this. And all the, all the phoropters were upside down until the genothermic refractor. This is the first one that hangs from the top. There's a book. The Wolfski Optometer. Tells you all about it. That was made by Daniel Wolf, which is the son of Michael Wolf. Michael Wolf is the guy who, who invented the cylinder. The way the cylinder thing works, that, uh, that needle attaches to a big gear in the middle. See, there's a big gear in the middle of this. And that, and that gear changes, drives all these cylinder lenses. There's 25, 50, 75, 1, all minus 2. And that adjusts the axis of all of them at the same time. See that big gear in the middle? That's part of the patent. That's his brainstorm. Michael Wolf applied 1916, patented 1917. That Chagon ski optometer has patent date of 1910. That was for the monocular one. He had only applied for the 1915 binocular one. Uh, Michael Wolf, when he got when he applied for this patent, he actually mentions Chagon in in the in the patent. So he's had his mind set on just adding cylinder to that one. Here's an advertisement for the Wolf Ski Optometer. Probably can't read that at all. And there it is. I'm sure you can't read it. Wall mount, floor mount, chair mount. The Wolf's, this is from 1918. A jeweler's magazine. It's all about it. I probably, I'm sure you can't read it. Here's the book, Theropters by Gary Campbell. He put that optometer, the, the Wolf Ski Optometer, on the front cover. The um, Stevens Therometer is really cool. You can measure somebody's four years in 15 seconds with this. Let me just do this here. You put it up here for vertical prism, and you measure it. It says right hyper and left hyper. You measure it right here. Tell me when the two lights are lined up like headlights on a car. Although cars didn't have headlights in those days, so you probably say headlights on a horse. I mean, you move it over here and you measure their horizontal for ESO, EXO, and you read it off of that needle. That's how Stevens ferometers all worked. These things all had them. I don't know who Steven was, but he must have made some money off of these things. The 1917 patent was used by General Optical. And the patent is the same thing. You put this needle that adjusts the axis of the cylinder. Here's a Steven's ferometer. Risley Prism. Risley Prism. Maddox rod on each side. This is the first really serious ferropter. This thing weighs about 10 pounds. Actually, it weighs more like seven or eight pounds. And just like that one, it's only got plus spheres. Those have, because this Chagon, the middle part is the same on both of them. It goes from Plano to plus six with only eight lenses, four in the front and four in the back. This one actually has ten lenses. There's five in the front and five in the back. So you go 25, 50, 75, 1, 125 in the front. And the big lens is 153, 450. 6 and 750. So it's got a range up to 875. All plus. The big drawback, when you put the cylinders like this, the, get, the mechanism inside of here is very impressive. Very big brass clockwork gears inside. I've, I opened up this one. So it goes from Plano to plus 875, and you got a plus 9. Minus 9 and minus 18. The problem with this is there's no quick way to go from, like, say, the patient is plus 4. You can't just go from, you know, Plano to click some major gear to get it up to close to plus 4. You gotta go through the whole thing to get it up to plus 4. And there's no quick way. And 
you can't you have no access to it just it's just this one little knob here but they thought about that and they gave what if the patient is minus you know if you're minus two you got to put in minus nine and plus seven to get to measure a person who's minus two that's terrible so they thought about that and they put a minus 150, minus 3, minus 450 and a cross cylinder, which is for the near point, the 14B test. These things didn't have Jackson cross cylinders. If you want to do Jackson cross cylinder test, you got to do it the old fashioned way, like which is better, one or two, you know. <clears throat> but the genothermic refractor was made until the mid 30s. I think it was put out of business by the Green's Refractor. I mean, obviously, if that's all you got, and the Green's Refractor comes out, you're just going to have to shut down operation, because there's no comparison between the two. In England, let me see if I can find... In England, they were selling the genothelmic equipment, the whole lane. Genothymic didn't just make for refractors. They made orthometers, they made the chair, they made the stand, they made the stool that went with it. And there you have a picture of the genothymic refractor. And this is a 1927 trade catalog in England, London. Look at that. It says genothymic equipment. It doesn't say it was made in America. They probably wouldn't buy it if they thought it was made in America. But when the Green's Refractor came out, and these guys went out of business, or they sold out the Chiron, which shut down the, uh, the refractor because they, they, they weren't selling anymore. They sold thousands of these. They sold thousands of these. But in England, they made the British Refracting Unit, which is basically exactly the same. Same knob. This mechanism for the axis is different, so it kind of... They had to take this and they moved it down to the side over here. The cylinders, the same. everything else is the same. So, they made that in the 30s and 40s even. Until the British started making their own version of the Fraptor. Uh, that's enough for this part two. Now I'm going to work on part three, which is going to be, we're going to talk about the American optical line, the Zeng. And we're going to show you some old optometers from the 1800s.